Thanks so much. Um, and in case you think that there's a dissonance between what I'm about to say and what we've just heard, hold on till my last slide. Um, and you may see that there are, in fact, some really important connections. Um, we are going to change scales, although I think as we were thinking about food, it goes very much from the personal right through to the place, the kitchen uh, and the globe. Uh, but we're going to come in at this, as our conference theme suggests, uh, from the other end. Um, and I want to talk in about uh, a general area of what we might call urban science, and I'm using science in its most general form here. Those of you who are social scientists, bear with me. I know it's a complex term, and we can talk about it in questions if you want. Um, but I am wanting to talk in particular um, about a domain that I call global, uh, the global urban agenda. Now, I know Christian's here somewhere, Christian Schmidt. Um, and Christian, I wanted to distinguish this, and others know your work very well. There he is up there smiling nervously about what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, it's, it's not the same as what we mean by planetary urbanism. Okay? What I'm talking about here is quite specifically in part a scale, the global scale. Okay? the multilateral scale, if you like. Um, not exclusively multilateral organizations, but I'm talking here about the composite of cities. In other words, when you add all the cities together, what does it give you? I'm talking about the global in the sense that we compare Africa and Latin America. I'm talking about the global in the sense that we have collective or universal policy positions on cities, like the SDGs the new urban agenda. Okay, so that's what I mean by the global. It's not an analytical or a dynamic. Um, I think it is, it, and I think it's very useful to hold on to uh, that concept. Not least because over the last two decades, probably, what we've seen is a rise in attention to the global scale. In other words, recognition, this is true if you go into Singapore or Zurich, they'll know that some policy decisions are made locally at the neighborhood and the city scale, some are made by national government, but some, in fact, are made globally. Okay? They're made internationally. And that shift was really prompted by one main scientific piece of evidence, which is that we were moving into a predominantly global world. And you must have been bored with that sentence in every paper you read. We now live in a majority urban world. The world is now majority urban. Yeah? I mean, the endless variations on it, but we've all seen that. It was incredibly influential. And the reality is, is that it was influential in a very crude way. What it did not do was to take account of the complexity of that global urban transition. Now, if you look at the diagram on the left, it gives you some sense of the trajectory of urbanization and the tipping point to towards a majority urban world. If you look at the diagram on the right, you get a sense of what is to face us. And I thought, Enrico, some of your figures on what does it mean when you compare Latin America, known to have rapidized, uh, urbanized recently, with what we are facing in Asia uh, and Africa, you begin to get some sense of what that red strip uh, means. And that means not just for those places. Everybody today, we were talking here at lunch about the importance of thinking about cities as they change in the context of a low-carbon uh, economy, the context of a post-COVID universe. There's no question that what we face has got to, we've got to up our game, if you like, in thinking about the science that informs the global. Now, it's not true that nothing has happened, okay? We're not working off a zero base. If you go across scientific communities, it is really quite remarkable how much work has been done to urbanize global agendas, okay? And not least in the recognition that to implement anything, you have to localize it, okay? Partly through SDG 11, but in lots of other ways. If you were at the UN, anybody who was there last month, uh, the midpoint of the SDGs, you will have heard them talking extensively about localizing. First ever forum to begin to have a platform to operate in the UN of local and regional leaders. The cities are well referenced in probably the most powerful body of science, the IPCC. Special reference to cities in the Climate Paris Agreements, 
Uh, the biodiversity people, I think, were probably exemplary in the work that they had done. And if any of you are involved, as I have been recently, with some of the health discussions, absolutely heartening to see the rise of a, what one might call a global urban health agenda. Okay, whether it's framed as One Health or planetary health, but unambiguous about the urban dynamics. So there's lots going on. Okay, so the fact of this urban world, a recognition of its concentration in the global south, and a growing consciousness of the severity and the complexity of the challenges that we have found, have at the same time as we've seen fundamental revolutions in the way knowledge is constructed and new evidence is found, has seen really quite a sea shift. Sea shift? Sea change. I'm supposed to be a first language English speaker and I can't get that right. Anyway, you know what I mean. A massive shift yeah? in the way that we, we, we gather evidence, the way that we talk about evidence, what it is that we talk about. It's much less ideological than it was before. Which is not to say that ideology is not important. It is. Of course it is. There are still paradigms which are incommensurate. But by and large, what we're seeing is a shift to what I'm going to call an urban science. And I heard somebody, I think it was you, Hugh, talking about it earlier today. Maybe uh, it, it was others as well. Okay. What does that mean? I think that it's still, urban science is still pretty chaotic as a domain. Mike Batty will be with us at some point. His recent book, I think, is useful in setting out some of those trends. I'm going to highlight different trends. And the reason that I'm doing that is that I'm not suggesting that these are in conflict with each other. I think they are, potentially. But rather that this is like different, it's, I suppose it's like different genres of music that evolve. Okay? They're all producing music, but it's not the same. Okay? It's slightly different. The differences are interesting. And here are four of the differences which I think we need to take cognizance of because they influence how we understand cities at the global scale. So the first is that I think pretty much everybody is working on the recognition that cities are complex. You think food is complex? Try cities. Okay? Multiple scales, multiple partners, multiple interests, multiple sectors multiple rates of change, okay? I mean, it's complexity on complexity, yeah? And the, the recognition is that we have to understand the internal flows and dynamics just as much as we have to understand static patterns and interests. Now, that's been made possible, I think, because of the interoperability of data. We can see things in more fluid ways. We can track the comings and goings, the flux of networks, um, of resources, of, of, of compounding interests, of scalability, partly because we can match temporal data, spatial data, and statistical data. So that shift, I think, is really important. Okay? It's an innovation. The second shift is about the people, Chris. It's really, and the IPCC led the way. Maybe we want to be quite critical about that. I personally am. I think we've landed up putting... An, an, an awkward attention to adaptation as a single concept, but it was a very real attempt to try and understand what social and ecological coupling meant. Okay? In other words, to bring people and social change and social behavior uh, into our vision of what a city is. If you look at the work that is coming out, the really cutting edge stuff now, it seems to me that the shift is moving away from the climate adaptation literature as a site of innovation to probably one that looks at the climate health place nexus, okay? That there's a recognition, in other words, that it's not simply a monolithic understanding of extreme heat or of uh, extreme uh, water or of uh, the absence of water, but rather more complex nexus, nexi, uh, between climate health infrastructure and demography that are really important. That's the first thing. And the second thing is this absolute recognition that the place where the social ecological coupling is absolutely critical to understand is in Africa. Okay? To some extent, Asia as well, um, particularly in the context um, of South Asia, but the African context, one that we simply don't understand and that is so large and so exciting as a potential domain of work that it is extraordinary 
that it is not recognized as the frontier of knowledge, let alone recognized in our conscience as the place of the most important intervention. So that's social coupling. Then it seems to me that the third thing, and there are many more people in the room uh, who are much better equipped to talk about this than I am, is that we can see things we couldn't see before, okay? Um, and we can see them, especially in places where we've got great data, we really can see things and things in relation to each other that we, we could not see before. So there are places that become visible and legible. And that's true, even of places like Kinshasa, okay, about which we know very little, let alone how many people are there. But we probably still know the, the, the growth in knowledge has been exponential in places that we already knew a lot about. The, place, the growth in knowledge has been good in places about which we know nothing. Okay? And so that's an important domain because once we see cities differently, some of that is conceptual. I know informal settlements, said Enrico to us, because I've been there and I've worked with them. Yeah? Lots of people who are mayors in the global north have no knowledge of what an informal settlement means. So you've got to be able to see the city to recognize it. And having new and different forms of data enables you to do that. And then the fourth thing I just wanted to highlight is that we all concede and, and we speak in favor of the idea of multidisciplinarity, the idea that you need no one person can come to understand the city. We've, we've got rid of the idea of the great man. There always was a man, I'm sorry. I, there are a few, maybe Jane Jacobs. Okay? But the, this notion that there were individuals who could see the city, we've given over to the idea that when we work collectively and interoperably, we do see the city better, and that where we draw from different kinds of knowledge, that we do so in ways that are better. We concede that we want psychologists and historians and anthropologists. The truth is the matter is that they're quite difficult people quite often, and they feel incredibly uncomfortable in the modes of practice that we set up. It's not true that the humanities are equal players in the interdisciplinary world of urban studies, and it's something we need to think very carefully about. As we gather momentum, okay, so I've been quite critical of each of those domains, but what I want to leave you with is the idea that those are growing. These, we're advancing, we're making progress. Not perfect, we can critique ourselves, but we are making progress. I now want to move to the domain of politics. And the crucial question for us is really, what is the politics of urban science at the global level? Okay? And the bottom line is that it's quite ephemeral. It's quite uh, opportunistic. Um, if you read the story about how SDG 11 came to be, you know, it really was a coffee shop meeting. Um, you know, they, they count for a lot, these coffee shop meetings, but they are really insecure as a modality for making some of the most important decisions facing humanity. And there is no robust evidence base. There is no robust uh, platform from which we are able to engage global, the global urban agenda as a community of science. Now, why is that? First of all, I think that the urban remains a blind spot. We know we're going to be an urban planet. We know that you can't do anything unless you localize it. But the institutions which drive the global agenda are comprised of nation states. The interests are sectoral. And cities are awkward and difficult. And mayors come and go. And they're not always the people who are prepared or able to take decisions on behalf of a globe. So it's a very difficult community uh, in which to engage. And some of that is about representation. I'm horrified that the new UN Secretary General uh, platform and um, scientific advisory board has nobody on it, nobody who knows anything about cities, not even in their particular domain, okay? Nothing. So we're not represented, we're not represented in the nation states, um, and so it's extremely difficult. But I also think that there is an internal problem in science. We don't have a common message. There's a confusion of messages. We are a large, eclectic community who have 
no coordinated messaging to give, or very little. And even on arguments like decarbonization, that has come out of the energy sector as an argument. It has not come out of the urban sector, who might have put land rather than energy as the driver of what would make for a reduction in emissions, at the same time as it would have made for a reduction in inequality. So I put to you that we've got some quite serious problems there, and what we need to be able to do is, of course we need transformative knowledge, we're getting there, but we also need effective platforms of influence. And maybe the time has come to move that opening storyline from your papers which can't start anymore with the sentence of we now live in a global urban world, got to find a new one. Why is the city important for the global community? This is not the answer, but it is some uh, sense of where you might have a look. It's a paper that we've just put out uh, with some ideas on it. Basics. We've got to get a tighter argument about what we mean by a sustainable urban development. Secondly, we actually have to be able to articulate the relationship between the economic and the social in ways that are not polarized and don't try and balance. They've got to be harmonized in some kind of way. Third, we have to find the political scientists who know how and where these, uh, these institutions work to help us land uh, our argument. And we have to critically change the geography of who speaks and whose issues are there. And this is the last slide, and you'll see where it takes us back to. In addition to all of those things of sharpening our science, sharpening our platforms of engagement, I want us also to think about the imperative of changing our disposition. What do I mean by that? A little bit of what you were saying with respect to food. We've got to have a different normative position. We've got to want something different. We don't just want fine cuisine. We don't want the best city for ourselves. We want cities that work for all and cities that work for the globe. We've got to change our analytical questions. How do you make soy sauce? Can I use fermentation in this process? To questions for the urban, like what makes a city work now and into the future, and that's going to be the priority for us to make interventions. And then finally, and crucially, we actually have to make it work. And I challenge you to make it work at the city scale, at the global scale. And that, as we've heard earlier today, is not an easy task. Thank you.